So we could put him in, in that environment. And some of the plant species and pollens in the soils and, and the soil composition was so unique that really you didn't have to go very far before you would change the fauna uh, and that it wouldn't match. So uh, it was such a limited geographic area where it could have been. Uh, he had a relationship with the victim anyway. So then, you know, when he was brought in for questioning and presented with all of these evidence, um, you know, he eventually confessed to the crime. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we're back today. We're going to be talking with somebody very interesting. We've got Dr. Jason H. Bird. He's a professor and associate director at the Maple Center for Forensic Medicine. He is an expert on forensic botany and entomology. It sounds very interesting. How are you today? I'm doing very good. How are you? Uh, doing doing quite well. Summer's on its way. We're excited to be warm because I'm coming to you from Germany, which mostly cold year round um uh, but um so and i just wanted to ask you again you're not are you from gainesville originally or are you from somewhere else i'm a florida native i was born in uh, daytona beach florida so uh, i'm not far from home a beach boy yeah D daytona is an interesting place to have grown up with bike week and biketoberfest and nascar and <laughs> Uh, all the college reunions there. It's an interesting community. Do you feel the need to go fast sometimes just because you have that? <laughs> it's in your blood? Sometimes. I am a NASCAR fan. I go to races. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I, like, to, I like to watch. But uh, difficult to actually drive fast in many places just because of traffic. But <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> Add some more lanes to the highway so we can go fast. Here we have the Autobahn, of course. You can drive as uh, fast as you want to drive. So. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I get that. Florida's Florida's really beautiful and uh, always always nice. Watch out for alligators, but you know, yeah, for, for the most part, our, our beaches are good though. Yeah, lots of them. Um, so, can you describe your role as the the associate director of this William R. Maple Center for Forensic Medicine uh, down there in the University of Florida? Go Gators! That's right. Yes. Go Gators. <laughs> um, yeah. So the job is quite varied, um, which is why I like it. Um, we have um, five graduate programs, uh, all told about a thousand students in our graduate programs that we have for uh, graduate education. We do a number of continuing education workshops every year. Um, and those are for people who are um, you know, not interested in a graduate education. Um, so a lot of in-service people, uh, law enforcement in particular, and we have um, almost a dozen workshops a year that we do. And um, the Maple Center for Forensic Medicine is also home to um, Florida's Mass Fatality Response Program, uh, which is called FEMOR. So we are the state's mass fatality response team. And we also have partnered with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, and we run their forensic science laboratory for all of their um, 800 approximately law enforcement officers in the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. And then separate from all that, we have a, uh, a veterinary forensic sciences laboratory where we accept casework um, from, the, from throughout the country, or actually from throughout the world. We do quite a bit of casework from Australia as well and um, Southeast Asia. Um, where law enforcement agents who have a case of you know, animal cruelty or animal neglect and they're looking for some forensic science expertise, um, they can send that case to us and we will assist them with it um, and apply all the same techniques and standards as it would be if it were a human crime. Wow. Wow. And forensics, it really sounds like it, uh, it's post-mortem, but it doesn't necessarily have to be post-mortem for you to go in and investigate, right? Most of our cases are uh, post-mortem. Okay. Uh, however, but for some of the animal cases, for instance, um, you know, they may not, uh, the animal may not have died. You know, it could have been, um, you know, abused or had some act of cruelty against it um, and still needs some aspect of investigation. Um, so we do that as well, even on, on live animals. And then, of course, a lot of our cases, particularly in entomology and botany, uh, although they're legal investigations, you know, they may not be criminal. They may be civil in nature as well, particularly with food contamination cases and entomology. 
Um, you know, so there's not a criminal component to a lot of that. It's civil, right? And someone may be responsible, so it may end up in court, um, but not necessarily, a, you know, a homicide or involve a, a human death. So we do get into a lot of um, civil litigation. Wow. Wrongdoing on some level, maybe just minor, but ranging from minor to major. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, we even get into some cases of, um, uh, you know, bed bugs, right? So um, if you're in the hotel industry, bed bugs have come back in force. Um, they're a major, um, major insect to deal with now. So it's not just roaches and rats and mice you have to deal with in your hotel. It's bed bugs. Um, we do a lot of that uh, type of litigation. We also help the hotels with some mitigation. Uh, it is can be complicated and complex and expensive to get rid of bed bugs once they've infested, you know, a, a hotel or, uh, you know, a building complex like that. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just civil. Like I say, you know, it's uh, you never know what the next case may be. Uh, and that's what keeps the job interesting. Did, did do you ever think, well, I can't go on vacation and stay in hotels anymore. I've seen too much. <laughs> That is true. Um, you certainly um, check your hotel room out fairly <laughs> well. Uh, and, and and you never want to take your little travel alternate light source to a hotel and check out your own hotel room either. Um, yeah, just uh, pull the bed sheets off, throw them in the corner, put on some slippers and, and try to make the best of it. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I mean, you never know who was there. Even at your own house, you don't want to have an electron microscope looking too, too down deep, right? No, no, your house, your car. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, sometimes the less you know, the better. Right. Ignorance is bliss. Uh, so what inspired you to specialize in for forensic entomology and botany and stuff? And, and how, how does that, how does that, uh, how, how does that contribute to in the field of forensic science? What, what, what inspired you, I guess, oh. is the question. So part of the answer is, I don't know. And then the other part of the answer would be luck. I suppose. Um, so yeah, I'm first generation uh, college uh, in my family. Um, and I was always interested in forensic science. Uh, don't know why. Certainly didn't have forensic scientists in my family or you know, no one from um, law enforcement. Uh, I guess it's just an interest I picked up from you know, TV and books, right? So it seemed like a very interesting job. So um, to obtain a entry level job in the forensic sciences, I knew I needed a four year degree in a natural science uh, or chemistry. So I sat out really to get just a four year degree in a natural science and growing up on a large farm, um, you know, biology was always very interesting to me. I did have an in uh, interest in entomology. Um, so I set out to try to find a college, and actually the day I came over to UF to talk to them about some of their programs in biology and entomology, I was speaking with one of their undergraduate course coordinators, and you know we had talked about entomology, and they said, well, had you been interested, or would you be interested in applying entomology into forensics? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, that you know sounds exactly what you know, I would like to do because I knew if I was going to go to college, I had to be interested in something, you know, uh, just in, <laughs> nothing that I could force myself to sit through these classes just because. <laughs> so uh, the day I was in that undergraduate coordinator's office, the local newspaper had a front page article on the University of Florida's medical and veterinary entomologist, who was also a very active forensic entomologist. And they said, and you may want to read this article. So they threw the paper across the desk. You know, I scanned the article pretty quickly and um, they said, well, I mean, he's in his office today. Would you like to go talk to him? So I said, eh, certainly. Um, so we had an unplanned visit in his office just a few doors down the hallway. And um, by the time I left that afternoon, I had a undergraduate uh, job offered to me in his laboratory. Um, so I worked in the laboratory as a student assistant, um, took my classes. Uh, I was offered a, a uh, assistantship for a master's degree. Uh, so I took that. And then during my master's program, I, write a, I wrote a grant for uh, funding for a PhD. And then that was funded. Um, so a lot of luck involved. Uh, mm. I just happened to be there the day the newspaper had a very relevant article. He just happened to be in his office. 
And, uh, you know, we struck up a, a really good conversation. So uh, a lot of it is luck, I guess. And, you know, as the doors open, just being able to take advantage of those opportunities and, uh, you know, make use of the um, uh, opportunities that were provided to me by the University of Florida. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of fall into it. And they say, look, it's an understudied. We need people if you want. It. And you just said, OK, why not? Got to do something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't set out to be a forensic entomologist specifically, but it was a great tie to my interest in forensic science in general uh, and my other interest in entomology and biology. So uh, it made it relatively easy. I won't say there's anything easy about, you know, a decade of postgraduate education and research and publishing and all of that. But uh, it made it easier because I was truly interested in the subject matter. Yeah. We're, so it really didn't seem like work or a job because it was something that, you know, I just had a great interest in and, you know, being provided with the time and resources probably would have done it anyway. But um, mm -hmm. the fact that I could roll all that into an educational program was um, a, a very rare opportunity that I didn't want to squander. Sure. And how, how did the glitz and glamour compare to your CSI Miami versus the reality of this? <laughs> Well, I have consulted for CSI. Oh, uh, really? The television show. <laughs> yes, I uh, consulted many, many episodes on that uh, with their set director, their art director, and, and some of their writers. So I have firsthand knowledge about how I can tell them uh, you know, a way that it sh we would do it. And then they're like, well, that's not, you know, that that's boring. Um, right. <laughs> we need to uh, make it more interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I would tell them exactly how things would be done and they would immediately trash all that and come up with their own way for television <laughs> and, uh, get it out there. So yeah, it's, uh, I, uh, a bit frustrating, but yeah, sure. we don't, uh, don't dress quite like they do, uh, aren't as good looking as they do. And, um, we, we can't solve every crime in a commercial break. So, sure. um, a bit of difference, but, you know, I think shows like CSI have been very good. Um, while, although not very realistic, I mean, they are based in science, you know, some of those concepts, uh, are, are very true, uh, may not be able to get there the way they showed them on television, but, you know, the concept was there and it provided uh, public recognition for forensic science, right? It kind of made forensic science a household name. Um, you know, when I went through my college education, there were maybe, um, at most uh, a, a dozen forensic science programs in the United States that you could have enrolled in, uh, and, and now they're well over 100. And, you know, that demand for educational programs have come from students, uh, and the students learn about forensic science from, you know, watching television. So, you know, not just the one show. I mean, it dates back. A, a lot of people probably um, remember Quincy, medical examiner, you know, the television show. Um, so there's always each generation has kind of had their own forensic science show, but uh, CSI series are really what got it out there um, and has been very beneficial just in generating public recognition for, for what we do and, and making it a, a more household term. Slightly more scientific than the Kardashians or some show like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so with your research that you've, you've been doing this qu quite a long time, is there anything specifically you're proud of that you feel like you contributed to the, uh, the field? Well, so it, it's quite um, different when you're in education, right? Because you've got your research program, you, you do research and that provides your colleagues with information they can work from. Uh, you have your educational program, so you educate students, and it's even, it's very different. Um, you know, if you teach in kind of the undergraduate realm, you're, you're in class, you teach your students, um, they do well on their written assignments and tests, and, and then they're out. Uh, in the graduate realm of education, you know, you work with students over multiple years, you know, through a master's degree, um, through a PhD. So you may end up working with a student for, you know, seven, eight years, um, and then they graduate and then they become your peers. And then you work with them in a, you know, a, a peer capacity. So it's kind of that lifelong mentoring relationship that starts. And then there's the service category where they're not your students, but they are essentially customers. They're, they're people who need your talents and abilities. They come to you with cases that they have. Um, they may take a workshop from you. You teach them one week and then they go back to their agencies and organizations. And the very next week, they're applying it to cases. 
Um, you may help them solve cases. So it's multifaceted and you are helping people immediately on many aspects of it as far as service and undergraduate education goes. Um, but in the graduate education, you know, you're helping someone build their own career, which will impact them for, you know, the rest of their life. Uh, and it's a, a lifetime trajectory for them to end up hiring on as a professor somewhere, going through all of the faculty ranks and then having their own lab and research and having their own students. Right. Yeah. So it becomes generational. Um, so having uh, the ability to impact um, you know, that many different aspects of people trying to interact with you know, what it is you have elected to do for your career um, is very rewarding. Yeah, I can imagine when you can sit back and say, well, the student has become the master. Um, yes, and they should know more than you, right? You're supposed to teach them what you know, and then they then set out and try to learn new things. So, yes, yeah, yeah. so that's very true that students should become the master if you're doing your job right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, we'll see. You know, it depends on the student, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. So, as an educator, uh, you both in criminal and civil legal investigations, uh, can you talk about maybe some examples of some impactful cases or some interesting cases where entomological, entomological? Oh, that's a hover. Where the evidence, or or the botany too? Name some ones that were really interesting. Wow, you know, there have been so many. Um, but, you know, just generally speaking, you know, the use of botany to place people in particular areas at particular times, um, there's often very few other types of science that could substitute for that. Um, we had a case um, where a, a clandestine grave site was found in a wooded location. You know, law enforcement does their typical investigation you know, their uh, homicide investigation, they have to try to develop a, a, a list of suspects, um, try to find witnesses, and then they try to, you know, uh, hitch that to forensic sciences, right, to try to provide some physical evidence to corroborate some statements. So there wasn't much evidence at this crime scene. Um, it was you know, out in the woods. And, um, you know, we do what we always do. We collect everything um, that we possibly can. So we collected soil samples and botanical samples and entomological evidence. You know, at, at that time, you really don't know who the you know suspect is. You may not know who the victim is. You just have to try to collect everything you possibly can, you know, because it's your one shot to be able to do it. And then through the um, investigation aspect, law enforcement develops some witnesses. And of course, most witnesses are, you know, I was never there. <laughs> you've got the wrong person that's, that, that's typical so in this case um that was the statement from the uh i guess leading suspect at the time that law enforcement had you know i was never there so you law enforcement then also has to obtain what a lot of people are familiar with as a search warrant right and you want your search warrant because you want to try to collect some evidence that would link them to the scene so a judge issues the search warrant and you know, the more invasive the search warrant, um, the less likely you may be able to get it. So you balance the uh, invasiveness of your search warrant with the likelihood that you're going to get some um, physical evidence. So you really want to craft your search warrant to be as minimally invasive as possible to increase the likelihood that you're going to you know, get approved for your search warrant. So, uh, you know, the search warrant really wasn't to, you know, ra ra raid the house and, and rifle through everybody's drawers. The search warrant was for the car. And um, we wanted to look at the car and look in the car. And one of the things that, you know, would, was put into the search warrant was we wanted to be able to seize the floor mats of the car. So, you know, low invasive, right? I mean, you know, going through your car isn't as invasive as going through your house and then, you know, taking the floor mats out of your car, not that invasive. So the, the search warrant was granted. We were able to um, sequester the floor mats and um, several scientists ended up doing some detailed analysis of the floor mats. We looked at the plants, we looked at the soils, uh, we looked at some of the pollen content and the debris on the floor mats uh, matched up precisely with the soils from the grave site, some of the pollens that were found in the soils of the grave site, some of the plant fragments that were there. So we could put him in, in that environment. 
And some of the plant species and pollens in the soils and, and the soil composition was so unique that really you didn't have to go very far before you would change the fauna uh, and that it wouldn't match. So uh, it was such a limited geographic area where it could have been. Uh, he had a relationship with the victim anyway. So then, you know, when he was brought in for questioning and presented with all of these evidence, um, you know, he eventually confessed to the crime. Um, because, you know, non-scientists really can't explain this away, right? You know, so they, they don't understand the entomology. They don't understand the botany. It becomes very hard for them to try to come up with alternate scenarios as to why they would have come in contact with all this stuff, why would have found it in their car. Um, and then often, you know, you, you either try to come up with scenarios and you box yourself in and build yourself into lies and contradict yourself. Or, um, you know, when you're hit with this information that you didn't know they had, uh, you're just kind of so overwhelmed with the facts of the case that, you know, um, we, we do get a lot of confessions. Wow. So really, this type of evidence is used um, not just in court. Uh, I think the minority of our cases actually go to court. It's used for the majority um, beforehand um, for these people to, you know, um, have the mountain of evidence that they face and eventually, you know, can confess to the crime or provide detailed information about, you know, who the who the perpetrators or other perpetrators were if they were just a witness. Yeah, that is so wild. And in, and, and but sometimes the fauna can be similar in lots of different places. And then do you ever come up with a like, well, we can't know for sure because every, you know, this tree or this bug is found everywhere in Florida. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some species are so ubiquitous that, you know, or the geographic area would they would be found is so wide, you know, it's not helpful. Um, which is why when we do our workshops and trainings, you know, we teach law enforcement to collect, you know, as many samples as they can, um, because out of, you know, a few hundred samples you may collect, um, not all of them are going to be the same species. And you may have some species that are actually quite rare mm. and um, would lead to a, a, a fairly limited um, geographic location. And, you know, that would be up to the expert to identify to the lay person. These, you know, many of these insects would look the same. So we do try to train them to collect um, much more than they think they need. And um, same for plants as well. You know, just don't collect the, you know, plants that are, are right at the body or touching the body. Try to collect plants that are around the area, the general area of your crime scene, because that helps the botanist understand the habitat you're in, you know, all of these plant associations that are there, which um, uh, could help tell the story of this one possible plant that may not be known to be in this association. So, yeah, I mean, you have to become a, a, a mini biologist, uh, essentially, not just a crime scene person to be able to collect enough evidence to sometimes help in those types of cases. But yeah, there are plenty of uh, plants and insects that are so widely distribute, distributed that um, you know their their geographic location is not going to help. Yeah. So if you're if you're convicted, you know, suspected of a crime, get a lawyer, but also get a biologist because you never know if that could <laughs> you might need that. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I think now uh, we have seen criminals try to account for forensic science. I mean, they wear gloves because they know about fingerprints. Yeah. Uh, they will wear a hat, you know, or some sort of a hair nap because they know that, you know, in some cases you can get their you know, DNA from shed hair, certainly get it from pulled hair. So they know about fingerprints and they know about DNA. But, you know, they probably don't think about the plant fragments that are in the tread of their shoe, uh, maybe get into the cuffs of their pants. Uh, the insects that may get on the front of their car as they are driving around. Um, you know, we had a case where it was a, uh, a sex crime, sexual assault, and the uh, assailant gained access to the victim's second story window by uh, essentially climbing a tree, walking out on a limb, getting close to the second story window, being able to open that second story window and get in the house. Um, when they got in the house, the fragments of bark from the tree came off of their shoes onto the tile floor. and um, a, a, the statement from the assailant was that it was consensual, you know, and the victim said no, and it was not consensual. So after an analysis of the shoe, um, still showing parts of the tree stuck in the shoe, 
um, parts of the tree in a little foyer in the kitchen by the window. You know, if it's consensual, then why would you need to crawl up a tree and come in a window? Um, <laughs> That's not romance. So, yeah. Right. So, you know, that type of evidence often just helps provide an extra piece of the puzzle, right? It substantiates a story or helps refute a story. You know, it doesn't prove anything all by itself. But, you know, once you get the statements and the affidavits, then you turn to the physical evidence. You know, that can help investigators clear up a lot of questions as to uh, whose story more may be more factual than the others. And of course, you know, you present all that to the trier of fact. And, and and let them decide. But uh, the more pieces of the puzzle that you can get together, um, you know, the, the better your case is going to be. That's wild. And and law enforcement will applaud you frequently, I'm guessing, for assisting in, in some of these cases and, and being able to get some of these insane criminals off the streets, right? Yeah, you know, the thing law enforcement has, it's twofold, right? You have to train law enforcement to be able to recognize the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's step one. And then even once they're trained to be able to recognize the evidence and they collect it, you have to provide them with a resource for the analysis. You know, a typical crime lab isn't going to be able to analyze most of this biological evidence that they could come up with. You know, crime labs often don't employ plant geneticists and botanists and entomologists. Some do, most don't. So then the other thing that happens is once you train these law enforcement agencies, you know, you or agents, you may not hear from them for a while, you know, a, a year or two down the road, then they eventually you get a phone call and they say, hey, you know, I, I was in your workshop. Now I have this evidence and I have to get it analyzed. So then the other part of our job is to try to find a scientist, you know, hopefully close to them. Um, they can analyze the evidence for them that they can build up a relationship with. And, you know, if, if that's not possible, then what we try to do is step in and, and use, you know, our laboratory resources or uh, the laboratory resources of other colleagues at universities and colleges across the country to be able to do this analysis for them. So it's um, it's education and then providing them the tool set to be able to use that. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can uh, get both of those aspects to work together, then it usually is pretty successful to law enforcement. Wow. And so obviously this is very highly technological based like you, the 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 analysis of some of this evidence and stuff relies on um technology how has it progressed since you started your career and what are some of the things you're looking forward to where you think well you know this if we could just get this one machine then that's the future and then we could yeah. we can tell what are you looking forward to in the field yeah, yeah. The one machine that does everything that's lightweight and you can carry it around. Right. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, that doesn't exist yet. On TV, it exists, I guess, because yeah. I've, I've seen some shows use that black box. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I'm, I guess, uh, unfortunately, I am old enough to, you know, have seen the first um, use of genetic evidence in a court in the United States, you know, and, and that was uh, here in Florida, it was in o Orlando. And many people thought then that, you know, this genetic analysis was so new and advanced that it would be uh, a flash in the pan, you know, kind of a one off deal. Um, and now here we are. <laughs> and, you know, I think uh, DNA evidence is, is pretty ubiquitous. So, you know, genetics in general have revolutionized um, the forensic sciences. And I think it is still in its infancy. Um, just because now you're getting into forensic genealogy and you're hearing about all of these old, very cold cases being solved through just the process of elimination of family trees, you know. And um, so I think forensic genealogy is going to be um, great, not just in cold cases, but solving current cases, because as genetic databases build up, there's just more of that information that's out there. So, yeah, I mean, my suggestion to, you know, incoming students is still, you know, if if you have the mindset for it, um, you know, get into a genetics program, study genetics, because it's going to be around, you know, for for a, a very long time. Um, and then, of course, you know, something that we do not do a lot of here, we do it in some animal cases with some support from law enforcement is digital forensics, you know, uh, analyzing cell phones, cell phone data. Um, where cell phones have been, pictures made on cell phones with the metadata. Um, yeah, just your electronic footprint as you, you live through life. Um, you know, there are 
you know, just one company alone owns over 14,000 security cameras in the state of Florida that are all in public locations. So as you just drive around, you know, you're, you're constantly on camera, um, whether you know it or not. So, you know, having people um, in digital forensics who are able to analyze the the volume of electronic data that is now out there and of course it grows every day. Um, I think digital forensics is certainly going to revolutionize the way you know law enforcement does their typical investigation work because now law enforcement can have access to traffic cameras and tag readers in real time. So if they happen to be looking for a suspect, they happen to know the car and the license plate, if it travels through a particular intersection, it's picked up on the card readers, law enforcement is alerted um, so they can really now in most places track vehicle movements in real time. Um, so you don't even really have to have the high speed pursuits anymore because you got cameras following the vehicle and you just you know, watch where they go and follow them at a distance and, uh, you know, um, you know, make the arrest and have the law enforcement action once, uh, you know, they're at their destination. So, sure. yeah, digital forensics, I think it's probably going to have as much of an impact, if not more than genetics has ever done. Yeah. And certainly safer to let let them go and just go get them later. You don't have to speed through, you know, residential zones to try to get your guy. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, the tracking is unreal. Yeah. And do you think that's a deterrent? Do you think that uh, the people, criminals know that they're being watched more often? Do you think it's a deterrent to crime or, or, or has the crime rate had been steady? I, I think it will be. Right. But I just think it's so new that, you know, it hasn't permeated much. You know, they don't can't speak for all criminals, of course, but I don't think most people in general and certainly the the criminal element realize um, the extent of, you know, uh, digital cameras and, and video cameras and surveillance in general. You know, there's now the little adage out there that says, you know, find the camera and you can solve the crime because, you know, everything mm -hmm. is being recorded. So I think that it will. I mean, I think that people will be as very much aware of how digital forensics are solving crime as they are now about you know, their DNA being left places as they right. as they go around, you know, hairs and fingerprints. So I think that it will be a, a deterrent. Um, and if it's not a deterrent, it will certainly increase the rate, um, the percentage of crime solved because there's going to be so much more on camera now than at any time in the past. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think people will always commit crimes, but it's like the movies you, you and I probably grew up with that we all watched, you know, shows and TVs and stuff. We do understand that the technology is is there and it does. It's being used. So, yeah, it's best to keep your nose clean, people. Come on. Yeah. Um, you not stop crime, but you might not get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess the last question I have is, you know, what... All the stuff that you've seen, I mean, working in crime can be pretty, I mean, you, I know you don't just do crime, you do bed bugs in hotels, which is very interesting too, but has it shake, shaken your uh, faith in humanity at all, seeing some of the horrible things that people can do? Well, I mean, uh, yes, um, because you see the, the worst, uh, what people do to each other, what, what people do to animals. Yeah. Um, it is emotionally trying. Yeah. You know, because you're supposed to be able to do this work, see, you know, what is really shielded from most, you know, it's shielded from the public, it's shielded from news, right? You know, where our news isn't, isn't plastered with, you know, um, the ultimate gore that's there, you know, I mean, they don't show dead bodies on your six o'clock news, they show aspects of the crime scene, but yeah, you have to see it, deal with it. And um, then, you know, you have to be able to turn it off. Um, at the end of the day, essentially, and, and go home and, and, you know, try to enjoy the time with the family and uh, do normal things and, uh, don't, and, and trust people and don't enjoy bring, things. But, don't, don't bring your work home with you, honey, please. Yeah, you know, I mean, you'll find that you're trying to talk about work with other people who aren't in forensics becomes difficult, you know, because um, they, they, they don't want to hear it. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, you can't talk about it in public places because um, yeah. a lot of it is should not be um, distributed. But, you know, on the other hand, it's been very difficult for students in teaching because we try to teach students um, the forensic science techniques. Right. You teach them the science behind it. Uh, we get them to go over to the medical examiner's offices and participate in necropsy. 
And some of the departments that work with us have, you know, a ride along program where they can kind of ride to crime scenes, but, you know, they don't let them go to homicides and suicides. You know, if you were to ride along, you may go to a traffic accident. And a lot of times the victims may have been transported by them. So you really don't get into it full force until you're actually in the job. Okay. So we've had a number of students who, you know, spend uh, four years in an undergraduate program, two or three years in a master's, hire on with a crime scene unit. And then that's their first time that, you know, they may be at a homicide scene. Uh, and there have been students who have just decided, you know, it's not for me. I, I, I can't handle it emotionally. Um, and it becomes difficult for them to compartmentalize their work from, you know, th their life and, and enjoyment in general. So we've had a number of students, um, you know, switch careers after getting into it. Um, and then everybody who is into it, I mean, you just find a way to compartmentalize it and, and go home at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, if you talk to a lot of people who do it, everybody kind of has their triggers, right? right. For, for a lot of people in it, it may be cases that involve children, you know, abuse cases and fatalities involving children. Um, others, it may be, you know, plane crashes because it just, you know, reinforces their phobia of, of, of flying. Um, and some are animals. You know, there are people who can do human cases, but just when we approach them with some animal cases and request the same help, they just can't do it because of their love for animals. Um, so I think everybody has their trigger, so to speak, and you have to eventually learn what that is for yourself, learn what it is for your coworkers, uh, and, and then help them manage. Because I think it's a job that uh, will get to everybody pretty quickly if you let it. Um, and, and certainly, uh, to say the least, could you know could lead to a lot of burnout. But I mean, at the end of the day, uh, as unique as the case material is, uh, you know, it is a job. Uh, and you try to work the job, do the best you can, affect some change, uh, and then go home and try to enjoy your own life as best you can. And how does uh, Dr. Bird, how does he relax in his spare time? What's he do? Do you shoot pool? What do you do? <laughs> well, I was playing shuffleboard at a conference the other day. Oh, cool. um, no, yeah. I, uh, I canoe and kayak a lot, um, do a lot of um, nature and wildlife photography. And then the other thing that I, I get into quite a bit, which is an enormous time sink, is I um, get into the restoration of classic automobiles. Oh, so shoot. I, I have a collection. I, I have a collection myself, and then I I do some restorations for some friends, and then we do some that is just for the purpose to buy and sell. So uh, it's very different from anything else I do, and, and that's why I like it. it. Gets me out of the lab and in, into the garage. Well, what are we talking here? A '57 Bel Air or a '62 Dodge Dart? What do you got? Yeah, we have done a lot um, over the years. Um, my 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 three most recent that I've done is a, a 1978 FJ40, uh, the Toyota. Um, I've done a 75 C30, and right now I'm just completing a 1953 M38 A1, which is a, a Korean military Jeep that wow. I was ended up being able to get. And I'm, Put them all back to factory condition or certainly the way it is um after the korean war it still has the 50 caliber machine gun mount on it so um trying to get them back and uh, eventually probably some i'll donate to a museum or something yeah it reminds me of the episode of mash where there's trying to smuggle out a jeep one part at a time uh, <laughs> um yeah well Great i could show. Yeah, great show. I think I would turn bright green if I had to do what you did, but I'm th thank God that somebody like you is doing it because uh, especially with animals, I love dogs, and I think you're right about the co compartmentalizing because you know, like like working at a slaughterhouse, you gotta be okay yeah. with with doing it, and you know, just do your job. But uh, yeah, so God bless you, um, Dr. Jason H. Bird, wonderful human being, professor and associate director at the Maple Center for Forensic Medicine, Forensic Botany, Entom Entomology. Incredibly interesting field. Thanks for taking the time today, my friend. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We'll sign off to everybody and we'll talk after. Bye, everybody.